Hey everybody, it's Albert. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the god Mithras. Um, I know I did that in the video Zeitgeist. This is actually dealing with something related but different. Um, it's if you one of the issues that comes up in this whole sort of Zeitgeist scenario, and one of the I mean severe problems, as I pointed out, is they're they have this idea, this this theory, these astrotheology that um, basically all these religions are based upon the sort of sun going through the zodiac once a year and and Jesus being just the latest incarnation of this sort of thing, of this sun world, solar cults or whatever. <laughs> um, one of the problems with this whole thing with the zodiac, of course, as I pointed out, was uh, since a number of the gods they mention and that they date, they're dating very far back. They're taking very early versions of them, say Horus or, or the, the, the Egyptian Horus or the uh, Persian Mithras, uh, or Persian Mithra rather. The uh, problem is it's actually before people were using the Zodiac. Um, <laughs> the Zodiac developed in Babylon somewhere between 1000 and 500 BC. And then we, and, and scholars can argue about the date, but everyone agrees it's in that, probably in that period, 750 to 500 BC. Procession of the equinoxes are in the last few centuries BC. And again, they could, there's a little wiggle room there exactly. Was it, you know, the, the general idea is Hipparchus. A uh, few people might ar argue Aristarchus of Samos, which is maybe a century and a half earlier uh, because of something he said, but it's not, it's not conclusive. Um, and some people actually argued later um, that, that this thing with even the, what with Hipparchus wasn't conclusive, but that's kind of a side issue here. The whole thing, though, is that this is way too late. I mean, after all, I mean, 500 BC, somewhere around there, is a little too late for the Persian Mitra, a little too late for the Egyptian Horus to be, it's particularly since you're dealing with that whole thing about the ages, the age of Taurus and the age of whatever. Um, uh, there's different kinds of counter evidence that, and, and I hear I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to be pointing to um, the, I'm looking at the Zeitgeist, they have a companion guide you can download, and I'll give a link to the Zeitgeist companion guide, the PDF that I, I downloaded from their site. Um, unfortunately, what I downloaded does not have page numbers, but if you're reading it in Adobe, it ends up, I believe, it's page 71 out of 220. Um, at least that's where I have it. And, and, and the, um, and you can certainly search for Ulansi, who's the person I'll be speaking of. It's E, it's U-L-A-N-S-E-Y, and you'll come up with him. him. So, um, it's David Ulansi, who's a Mithraic scholar, and, and a very well-known one. And in fact, this is his book, The Origin of the Mithraic Mysteries, David Ulansi. Very good book, by the way. He has a theory of the um, Mithraic religion in the Roman Empire. And note, I said in the Roman Empire because it's very specifically mentioned that's what it's about. Um, now, what's interesting is like in this thing, they're discussing the, all the ages and the processions, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I'm going to read what it says from the top of the page. The association of the bull slaying god Mithra with the sun... The sign or age of Taurus the bull was made by Porphyry, and from the evidence it is clear he was repeating an earlier tradition. And then it goes on he, he, to mention some other ancient, like late writers of late antiquity. He says, concerning Mithraism, philosophy professor Dr. David Alansi says that recent work raised, has raised the possibility that Mithraic sanctuaries were used as astronomical observatories and that holes piercing the walls and ceilings may have been placed for specific astronomical purposes. Dr. Alansi concludes the Mithraeus came to know about and attribute importance of the position of the celestial equator as it was with when the spring equinox was in Taurus. As we have seen, the knowledge of the procession evidently dates back centuries before being formally described in writing by Hipparchus in the second century BC, and appears that in Mithraism we possess a clear vestige of the myths and traditions developed during the age of Taurus, as well as centuries afterward, in order to reflect a supposedly proper mythology for that time period. 
This point about Mithra's relationship to Taurus is demonstrated quite well by Alansi in his book of the, the Origin of the Mithraic Mysteries. Now, when I read that, my first reaction was, were they reading the same book? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, um, and, and let me explain something, and, and a lot of people may not be aware of it. Um, a lot of the things you'll see written about Mithras with, on this topic are derived from a fellow named Franz Kumont, wrote in the early 20th century. It was, he was the first person to really write extensively about, about the Persian god Mithra. Um, and he, it, it's a ground, he was a groundbreaker in that sense, that he was the first person to really do everything. And he was extremely influential and kind of like his, his ideas ruled the roofs for a good number of decades. Problem was, um, and this happens in a lot of fields. The first person in there is basically, you know, set it, blazing a path, and it's more collecting the data and, and not necessarily doing the best analysis always. And what he did was piece together things over many, many centuries, many millennia actually, and a number of millennia, and in various places. And just simply, if he saw he everything he assumed that he saw. He assumed applied everywhere at all times. Now, that in itself should raise some flags because, I mean, you think about it. Um, if you were to, let's say, go to a modern evangelical megachurch, and, and let's say you're doing this many years in the future when such things may not exist, and, and you, they are, they, they, you know, they come across Willow Creek or something, and they decide, well, that's the way Christians also worshipped in the fifth century. Obviously, there'd be a problem. And you can't, I mean, you can't even assume that all the beliefs are constant. There may be a core there, but obviously, things will change over time, etc. Things are just going to change. But Kumat basically assumed a static cult of, Mi of Mithras, and assumed the Persian version, and here's the real, the, the real cutting point, he assumed the Persian version and the Roman version were the same. Um, in fact, as Alanti makes quite clear at the beginning of his book, uh, they're not. Um, and the Persian version, of course, evolves over many centuries. Uh, it, it starts in an earlier period, and then with the rise of Zoroastrianism, it sort of takes on a different, Mithra takes a role in that, and it, it's it's a very, there's a lot of evolution there, in, in, even in the Persian version. But the Roman version has, as he points out, really is nothing. It, it's, it's, it's its own thing. In fact, he um, associates the, act, rather than with, even though the, the name is borrowed, um, he actually associates the Roman Mithras with, the, with Perseus, um, who was also associated with with Persia, as was Mithras, and so there was this. It was a, it was basically a conflation, and it was a creation of a Hellenistic mystery religion um, that he dates to somewhere in the first century A.D. So it really has nothing to do with anything earlier. Um, it's, it's it's the Roman version is its own animal, um, and what he's saying about what he's saying is specifically about the Roman version, um, and, and so that's number one. Uh, Number two, he doesn't at all deal with, um, in terms of, he, he's not at all supportive of the idea of this early dating of procession. In fact, he very makes it quite clear that he considers procession to have been discovered by, by Aristarchus in, the, in a couple centuries BC. He made that's just, he just says it right there. That's, that's it. Um, and in fact, the entire idea in his book is the Roman version of this cult was designed around the recent discovery of procession and what this meant for the, 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 their cosm the, the Hellenistic cosmological ideas. As there was this overarching thing above the heavens themselves that was making the heavens themselves change, and this basically was dealing with that, and that you can read in the book. By the way, it is a very good book. And it's in, I know, it was in my, I, I actually have, my, have a copy, but it was actually in my local library, so it may be in yours, and I really suggest reading it. It's a, if you're interested in this, it's a, it's a really good book. Um, so a little plug there. Um, but that's what he's talking about. Uh, and, and But, but the, the kicker, and where I, I, I just really was kind of shocked, is he does not, all the, first of all, he does not associate it at all with 
the age of, of Taurus. In fact, the whole idea is because of the change, Taurus was dead. That's why Mithra slays the bull. Get it? See, it's the recent that they recently discovered um, procession. Procession. The last, the previous change was with Taurus. The bull was slain, so actually he would be associated with, with an age of Aries. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that, and, and this is one of the things that are, that's pointed that he, he he wrote. He actually did a there was a German translation. I believe it was German. And he wrote some appendices that were not that are not in the English version, but he's made them available on his website, and I'll give a link to the the, the specific appendix um, where he people ask him, "Well, wait a minute! If you're saying first century A.D., why is this not? You know, as Zeitgeist says, that would be the age of the fish. Why is he why is he not you know slaying a, a ram or something or something? You know, because he would be a fish. And as he points out, why that may be." What people are doing now, in terms of saying the age of Aquarius is going to be, you know, or the age of Pisces began it, that's not what they did 2,000 years ago. Um, they're derived, basically, he's, he, uh, uh, there was a very scholarly, a lot of scholarly work done on astrology by Alan Lugabauer, and this is many decades ago, um, where, where you get the Babylonian system A, Babylonian system B, and all this. Um, and it's not something that I would really necessarily recommend reading because unless you're really into Assyriology and, and technical details of astronomy and astrology, it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense. But basically, their version of how the sky divided up is not at all with to do with our version. So the age of Pisces did not begin at, you know, 1 AD, as it says in Zeitgeist. But in fact, under the system in, in, at the time, it would have been eight or 900 AD. Um, that in fact the previous change would have been to Aries. That would have been the most recent one. And I'll point to the link in the appendix where he discusses this, um, where you can see that. And um, unfortunately, the book isn't online, but I, I don't know how much of it is. You can see in Google Book Search, but you can, certainly um, it's there. Uh, it's, part of it is there. But I, um, the the other thing, and and this kind of, I, I did a little search myself to see what people were saying about this, and and. It's really kind of amusing. There, there are a few supporters of this whole idea, um, and and not any. And, and I haven't found it in any of the major ones. It's just out there on the web. So I'm not going to point fingers to any individual, any well-known individual, um, you know, because I, I haven't found anyone specifically saying it who I would, you know, who's like a major public proponent of this. But I see it out there on some websites. Um, there was a fellow named uh, a. a, a there's a historian of science named Noel Swerdlow um, who actually did a debunking of some of these ideas, um, at least the, the whole idea of the, the astrotheology and said, like, they didn't, you know, there was no early procession, that's just no evidence of it. And some people have gotten the idea that Olancey debunked Swerdlow on that. Um, and I have no idea how, and what they did was they took it. One of the one of the, a statement where Swerdlow was debunking something or not debunking, but basically making an academic argument. Now, whether Swerdlow's point was correct or Alancy's, you can judge for yourself. But they're making this sound as though Alancy was debunking the the idea of that Hipparchus was the one who came up with the procession, and that's not even what they're arguing about. You see, what happened was with Alonzi's, Alonzi's book basically is is putting forth a his theory. Now, there, he is his theory, by the way, is not the major, even the majority theory. Um, a lot of people are just hesitant because of the really kind of there really isn't anything other than artifacts we had. So, you know, it's it's you're going by that, and some people just don't buy his idea. Um, and, and by the way, if it, uh, there's another book, if you're interested in the subject, on, on the, there's another book I would recommend by Otto Klaus called The Roman Cult of Mithras, if you're interested. He takes a more, like his basically is more of a survey, and here's what people have been saying, and here's what this guy says, and what this guy says, and here's basically what the evidence, this is what we can say for sure, this is what 
these are the different, and it's more of a neutral thing. But Alonsi is specifically arguing for the the um, procession argument for the. But again, this is late. This is after um, post Hipparchus, you know, by many by a number of centuries. Now, what um, Swerdlow had argued um, and was arguing against Alonsi's interpretation was that he didn't believe. It's Swerdlow's opinion that even Hipparchus really didn't discover the procession, that it actually, at least in the Hipparchus, his argument was something along the lines of Hipparchus sort of threw it out there, but wasn't really confident in it and wasn't really saying this was the only, he said, well, maybe this happened and maybe this happened and maybe maybe this is, but he, he, he said it's not definitive. Um, so he was arguing actually that they didn't even have no, a firm knowledge of procession until around the time of, of the astronomer Ptolemy. Uh, and and Alonsi was making the argument that Hipparchus did, was in fact, did have knowledge of procession, was in fact confident of it. Neither one of them was arguing for an early knowledge of procession prior to that period. Now, there is a possibility that, as I said, Aristarch, Aristarchus of Samos, because he, Aristarchus of Samos put some things out there that if you put them together, you can kind of come up with procession, but that doesn't mean he put them together, because it, at least with what we have of him, it's not, it's not really clear that he put all the pieces together, but he had, he seemed to have all the pieces there. He just may not have, you know, done, basically taken it to its final conclusion, whereas with if with, from the evidence we have with Hipparchus, it's pretty clear. In fact, Ptolemy credits Hipparchus apparently. But um, but yeah, I'll, I'll also put a link to that article so you can see what I'm saying. So, uh, but this whole thing in the Zeitgeist Companion Guide that somehow Alonsi's arguing is associated with the the cold, the, the era of the or the age of the bull is just wrong. It's arguing for the age of the ram, and the age of the ram is much later than what it says in Zeitgeist, and he's not arguing for an early knowledge of procession. In fact, he's arguing for a late, the same knowledge that everyone else has been, scholars basically have known, which is around a few centuries BC, and, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, and I'll give you the links, and you, if you want, you can take a look at the book, and thank you very much for your time.